Right. I hope you guys can hear me. I'll start the class. Right. The topic for today is vestibular schwannoma. And this is also known as acoustic neuroma, acoustic neuroma as well. This is basically the rundown of what we'll be discussing today. I don't think this is a major question for you in your undergraduate exams, but um, um, we'll just be running through these points today. Right. So what you basically need to know is the anatomy of the cerebrolopontine angle, which is the area that's marked here. This is a triangular shape for the CSF. Um, superiorly, inferiorly, all the boundaries of, of this area is not essential for you to know unless you're planning to operate on one of these cases. So basically what you need to know in this area is inside this cerebral pontine angle, you have your emergence of the facial nerve here and the vestibular cochlear nerve here, just below it. Um, these are the anatomical landmarks that are surrounding it. That's of uh, high clinical insignificance if you're planning to operate on one of these cases. Um, so for an uh, undergraduate level, what you need to know is uh, the internal acoustic meatus, which is what you see here. This is the passage of both the vestibular cochlear nerve as well as the seventh nerve um, from the cranial vault into, the, uh, into its foramen. So the first part of it is done through the internal artery canal, which is uh, which is what you see in this diagram here. Um, so in the anterior aspect of the internal artery canal, you can see that superiorly you have the seventh nerve, and inferiorly you have the cochlear nerve. In the posterior aspect, what you have is uh, the superior vestibular nerve. In the posterior inferior aspect, what you have is the inferior vestibular nerve. This is divided into four quadrants by a vertical bar known as the Bilt bar and a transverse crest that you see here. So this is very important to understand that this is how uh, the cranial nerves are transmitted from the cranial vault into the foramens or the external or its end stages. And uh, an easy way to remember this is by a small mnemonic. Anteriorly, what you have is uh, seven up the drink it will be seven up because it's always superior and uh, Coca-Cola down. So you have the cochlear nerve down. And inferior, posteriorly, you just have the superior and inferior vestibular nerve, which uh, I think it's not too hard for you to remember. Um, coming to the epidemiology, you have, uh, th these are not, these are most common tumors affecting the cerebral pontine angle. And 80% of tumors of the cerebral pontine angle are acoustic neuroma, neuromas or vestibular schwannomas. And 8% uh, of them uh, have an intracranial course, so um, they extend into the cranial vault. So the incidence is very low. You have only 10 in 1 million individuals per year, and they usually present at the later stage of life, about the age of 40. Um, they can initially appear to be in a sporadic uh, nature. Sorry, it can also appear to uh, present to you in a sporadic nature with 95% of the patients complaining of sudden hearing loss. And a few of them have uh, neurocystic fibromatosis or familial VSs associated with this. Uh, the age of the non-sporadic forms are quite early in life and during the 20s and 30s of life. Um, there's not much that you need to know about the pathogenesis, but what we can say is most of the vestibular schwannomas, they arise from the superior and inferior vestibular nerve at the transition zone uh, called the obstinar radialis zone. This is the most important thing you need to know in this. And this transition zone is in the lateral part of the cerebral pontine angle or the medial part of the internal artery canal. So this is the area that commonly uh, houses this tumor. Uh, Vestibular schwannomas are most commonly, they arise in the internal artery canal more than the cerebral pontine angle. So like we mentioned earlier, the intracranial extension is quite low. Only 8% have an intracranial extension. The majority of them arise inside the internal artery canal. And that's because this is a highly debated topic. 
this vestibular stenomas arise from, but they most commonly they suspected from rising from the vestibular nerves due to the highest concentration concentration of the Schwann cells, which is basically present in the obstinate red leg zone. Um, the mutation for this is uh, the 22Q12 gene, and uh, NF2 patients also inherit this disease as well. I'm really bad at pathology, but uh, I'm not really sure how to differentiate these two cells. But what you need to know is that Anthony B and Anthony A cells will be present in uh, vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas. Uh, I'm really poor at pathology, so I'm not going to go deeper into that. Uh, this is a very important uh, for all of you clinicians out there, that the natural history of this disease is, is extremely slow growing tumor. So you have this tumor growing at a pace of 1.8 millimeters per year. Now it's, that's really, really slow. And the reason why that's important is because uh, the signs and symptoms will be gradually progressive over a period of time. And uh, the structures that are surrounding uh, the vestibular nerves in the internal artery canal will be compressed slowly over this period of time. It won't be a sudden compression. So even if it does have an intracranial course extension, it will be a slow compression of these things. Uh, there are uh, incidences where you can get rapid expansion of the lesion. that usually due to cystic degeneration or hemorrhages or, or rapid uh, neuro neurological deterioration of the tumors or hemorrhages where you can have a rapid progression of the disease. But these are uh, f few and far apart. Um, so the most important from the natural history is that the growth will compress the cochlear nerve, causing unilateral hearing loss or unilateral sensory nearing hearing loss with tinnitus and vertigo. And as, as far as vertigo is concerned, as I've mentioned earlier, this is a very slow growing tumor. So it will compress the vestibular nerves very slowly. And because of the slow compression, what you have is the opposite vestibular nerve will have enough time to adequately uh, um, um, compensate for uh, the affected vestibular nerve damage. So what happens is many of these patients initially present with uh, vertigo and it slowly disappears over time. The main complaint these patients will come to you with is sensory neuro hearing loss with tinnitus. And again, that's due to the compression. Um, so another thing that you need to know is the motor fibers of the facial nerve are extremely resistant to injury during the intracanalicular phase. So the patient's facial functions are quite normal. They say that the motor fibers of the facial nerve are more centrally placed. So even compression on the peripheries are not going to cause much damage to the facial nerve. Um, once the tumor grows into the cerebral pontine angle, which is the medial aspect of the canal, they can grow freely without any symptoms because most of these structures can be displaced freely. As we mentioned earlier, this is a space mostly uh, containing CSF. So you're not going to get much compression unless the tumor is quite large. As we mentioned here, so uh, after it reaches a size of 3 centimeters, it abuts on the CPA boundaries, causing symptoms and signs. So as we mentioned earlier, it grows just nearly 2 millimeters per year. To achieve 3 centimeters is going to take a significant amount of time. And this is one of the reasons why these tumors are diagnosed quite late in life as well. Uh, compression of the fifth nerve causes corneal and mid face numbness and pain as well. As uh, this is the, the trigeminal nerve will be present inside the CP angle. So some of these patients might have these symptoms. Uh, and other further distortions include a seventh, eighth and seventh nerve uh, function. So you can have loss of hearing, you can have a small hearing loss as well as small uh, loss of sensation. So as you know, the seventh nerve supplies the posterior aspect of the external auditory canal, not the internal auditory canal. So in some of these patients, when you examine them in OPD, you can pass a probe and slowly touch the posterior aspect of the external auditory canal, and they will not have any sensation there, which means there is a compression of the seventh nerve's uh, sensory function. And uh, if it's an extremely large tumor, it can also distort the fourth ventricle. So this is just the tumor that's just uh, in the CP angle, as you can see here. It's a contrast axial MRI with a gadolinium scan that's done. And you can see it extending into the CP angle. And as it increases in size, it naturally um, compresses the structures around it. Signs and symptoms, as I mentioned earlier, you have uh, auditory functions. Uh, hearing loss in 95% of the patients with progressive uh, slow hearing loss with noise distortion 
and 20% of these patients will have sudden sensory or hearing loss. The improvement of hearing loss with or without treatment does not rule out the retrocochlear disease. A level of uh, hearing loss is not clear, clear, clearly related to itself. And tinnitus is also high in 65% of patients. Uh, and you all know what tinnitus is. I'm not going to uh, spend much time on that. So, like I mentioned, the vestibular component will be self-limiting episodes of vertigo because the patient will be able to tolerate this uh, disequilibrium because of the compensation of the opposite side. And because it's a slow-growing tumor, the body has enough adequate time to compensate for its disease. Facial numbness is due to the, pre uh, due to the impact of the trigeminal nerve. And corneal reflex being absent is also due to the trigeminal nerve. Um, and facial function is mostly preserved in these patients. And I as I mentioned earlier, you can have, have uh, numbness of the posterior wall of the external artery canal. This is known as Hitzelsberger sign. Uh, again, as the tumor grows larger, you can have uh, compression of the other nerves. So you have uh, the second, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve being compressed. You should always remember that abducer nerve is the longest cranial nerve in the body. So any raised intracranial pressure can also affect the abducer nerve. Hydrocephalus, as we mentioned, if it can obstruct the foramen of Lushka, the, the drainage of CSF also decreases, and this also in, can cause hydrocephalus as well. And uh, these symptoms are very rarely seen, but if it compresses the other nerves, such as the ninth and 10th nerve, you can have a hoarseness of voice or dysphagia or aspiration as well. So what you need to know is all cranial nerves should be examined quite thoroughly if a patient is suspected for acoustic neuroma. So how do you evaluate a patient for acoustic neuroma? Uh, this is done through a, a, a multiple modalities. You can do audiological tests where pure tone audiometry can be done um, and uh, vestibular hearing as well. You can do ENG or electronistomography with caloric testing. Imaging is done with CT and MRI. And neurological testings, as we mentioned earlier, you can evaluate all the cranial nerves as well. So PTA basically shows a sense in your hearing loss with, uh, in 70% of patients. So this is a speech discrimination score that you see here. And in patients with the retrocochlear pathologies, or an example of a retrocochlear pathology is acoustic neuroma, you can see a sudden dip here. As, it, as you increase the decibel size. And this sign is very indicative of a retrocochlear pathology, especially in speech discrimination scores. Vestibular testing is done with ENGs. As I mentioned earlier to you, these are tests are not commonly done because um, uh, of this compensatory effect. The patient might not even come and complain of uh, these type of lesions to you. Um, Bera is a uh, very, very accurate test for this. So what you have is a stacked ABR, which is a new test that I've not mentioned it here. So you can see the sensitivity and specificity of BERA here. You can read through this. Basically, BERA is extremely sensitive to any retrocochlear lesion. A new modality is called a stacked ABR, which evaluates every nerve inside the, uh, all the vestibular cochlear component of the uh, internal artery canal quite significantly. And you can even rule out extremely small lesions. So you can see even the tiniest lesion can be found with ABR. And this is a much cheaper investigation of choice, especially in our country, where many patients won't be able to afford uh, an MRI or a CT scan. Naturally, the gold standard treatment is an MRI because it gives you both uh, uh, visual, visualize, it gives you a good uh, visualization of the tumor. So this, this basically allows you to operate on these patients as well if it's needed. So you can see with an MRI gadolinium contrast scan, you can see this lesions taken up quite well. Now, about 20% of patients, you can have bilateral lesions, maybe one being smaller than the other. Management. Uh, so you have a couple of ways of managing these cases. I don't think you need everything in this slide. It is just for those who want to read a bit extra about it. So you have two ways of uh, going about it. One is the surgical removal of these tumors, which is... Uh, 
Uh, sorry. Uh, so one is the surgical removal of these tumors, and these surgeries are a bit complex. They're skull-based surgeries, uh, lateral skull-based surgeries, and they're quite difficult to perform. Or you have observation and radiotherapy. I just want to stress on this before I show you a video of the surgical removal. In observation and uh, surgical therapy, uh, what you need to know is that uh, some of these patients are quite old. So if you have a, a patient who is... Uh, I'm sorry, just give me a second. Yeah. So if you have a patient who's over the age of 70 and with a tumor the size of one centimeter, what would you do? I'd like to see your responses on your chat box. If you have a patient over the age of 70 with a tumor in one centimeter in size, how would you like to proceed with this patient? Right. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but uh, nonetheless, so a patient who is quite old, you don't really um, go ahead and operate on those patients, more, mostly because skull-based surgeries are quite technically challenging. And secondly, because uh, you, these, because of the slow, yeah, do nothing and uh, you can monitor them slowly. That's the best option to do because of the slow growth of these tumors. The other approach is radiotherapy where you have something called a gamma knife. And a gamma knife is basically a stereotactic radio surgery where you can specifically point the radiation beam to the specific area to slow down its growth or completely destroy the tumor. So surgeries are quite rarely done only for symptomatic patients and younger patients. And the approaches we have, I'm just going to talk about these three approaches and not in detail as well. So each approach depends on the size of the tumor and if you want to preserve the hearing for these patients as well. So if the tumor is large, you might need to go for a retrosigmoid approach or a translabyrinthine approach, but you're going to kill this patient's ear while you're doing so. So they're not going to get a great, um, good quality of life following many of these surgeries. I do want to show you guys a video of a, of a middle cranial fossa approach. Uh, um, so all of you have answered it correctly. So there's no medical line of management. You can just wait and watch. None of them are going to get affected. I'll just uh, change my slides. Just give me a second. I just want to show you a surgery. It's a middle cranial fossa approach for... Acoustic neuroma. So I hope you guys can see this now. So you can see there's a small lesion here, and the middle cranial fossa approach is preferred for these type of patients. And you can see the drop in. Uh, so this is the incision that's made. It's a, uh, a C shape. I don't know if this video is playing extremely fast or I'm slow. Right. So basically, a C shape incision is made over the lateral aspect of the head, and a bearer is put intraoperatively as well because you can see the compression on the vestibular cochlear nerve. So this gives you a good uh, idea of what's happening intraoperatively as well. So you can see a C-shape, inverted C-shape incision is made or question mark incision is made over the temporal bone here. And the skin flap is raised anteriorly. It's an anterior blaze flap and you expose the cranium. And you harvest the periareolar tissue here. And you can make a flap over the external artery canal, anterior to the external artery canal, so where you're expecting the internal artery canal to be. So once you expose it and the bone is drilled out, you have your middle cranial fossa floor here. This is the dura here. This is the middle cranial fossa floor here. So what you need to do now is to identify the pitris ridge. So you can see the surgeon slowly pushes back over the cranium and identifies the ridge. So he's just identifying his anterior, medial, and inferior aspects for the surgery. And the acid girls uh, retract his place to retract the brain here. So these are the two things that you are using as a landmark. So you have your middle cranial fossa floor here, and you have your superior semicircular canal identified here. And the internal artery canal comes through this. So once the internal artery canal, it, the facial nerve basically comes around like this into the middle ear there. So once you identify this, you have to <coughs> use these landmarks to expose the um, internal artery canal. So these, once you identify the superior, sorry, I'm sorry. Once you identify the superior semicircular canal, uh, 
you can find the um, internal aortic canal at an angle from this. So I think it's a 30 degree angle from the superior semicircular canal. Or the other way of identifying it is a retrograde dissection of the greater superficial, superficial petrosal nerve, which is, uh, you can damage the nerve quite uh, easily, so that method is not avoided. <clears throat> so these people are basically drilling medial to the uh, ex uh, superior artery canal, and the internal artery canal dura is exposed right now. And once it's exposed, they're exposing the whole length of the internal artery canal here. And the porous acoustic is the opening of the internal artery canal. And they're just opening it up here. And this is a nerve monitor. So it basically gives stimulation to the face. And the uh, doctor is able to identify the facial nerve from the internal artery canal. Right. So once the internal artery canal is completely exposed like this, what they can do is expose it. They can go through the dura, and you can see how far away it is. And the advantage of doing lateral skull-based surgery is there's less morbidity to the patient. To approach this from a normal craniotomy will be quite high. I mean, the, the normal craniotomy will be quite... There'll be a lot of side effects for these patients. So they're exposing the internal artery canal dura here. So this is a nerve monitor as well, and he's able to identify the facial nerve in, within the internal artery canal. So this structure that you see here between these, this is the posterior or the superior vestibular nerve, and this is the facial nerve. Now the surgeon is dividing the superior vestibular nerve away from the facial nerve. And they debulk the tumor to remove it. <laughs> so you need a lot of patience and a good steady hand. But as you can imagine, the morbidity to the patient is quite high in these cases. So the advantage of this middle cranial fossa is that you're not going through any of the um, structures of the ear which will cause very little damage to the ear. And you can see the brainstem response has changed following this surgery. And that's pretty much it. I'll just uh, come back to our slide. Great. So, like I mentioned, each approach has its own benefits and demerits. Uh, so, you can see the translabyrinthine approach. You have to go through the labyrinth, and uh, it causes a lot of hearing loss, and it's usually advised for patients who only have a more than 30 decibel hearing loss. Um, so this is just, I don't think this is really needed for you. I don't think any of the surgeries are required for you. Um, and the last I wanted to mention was stereotactic radio surgery. So this is basically a new modality. It's also called a gamma knife. It's basically, you can Google it, you can take a look at it. It's basically focusing external beams of radiation to a specific point in the body, which will uh, reduce the growth or decrease the size of the growth, which uh, aids these patients quite a lot. And this is the preferred modality of treatment. So if you use a gamma on a knife and the, treat, the, the size of the growth isn't reducing or it is extensive in size, then you can plan for surgery. Right. I think that's my class. Um, so the advantage of the gamma knife is uh, basically you have hearing preservation in a lot of these cases. And uh, even after three years, you have 50% uh, residual hearing in these patients and the facial nerve dysfunction is very low the, the the reason why there's a high margin here is because some of the some people debate that this tumor arises from the facial nerve as well and it's a huge debate on where this tumor actually arises from so people are not very sure um, and 20 percent of patients will might have trigeminal neuropathy uh, and hydrocephalus is definitely a complication of radiation as well 
So the pros and cons of these surgeries are not needed for you guys. What you need to know is just the types of surgeries. That's the middle cranial fossa approach, trans labyrinthian approach, retrosigmoid approach, and gamma. Saying that itself will make your examiner really happy. All right. Thank you so much. That's the class. I'll just take attendance, so please don't leave the class yet. All right. I I think there's a question here from Guy3. Although the damage to the ear is less in trans approach, won't there be more damage to the seventh nerve in the middle cranial fossa approach due to the anatomical location of the seventh nerve and debulking the tumor? They're, they're, this is why they use a nerve monitor. So before the surgery starts, we uh, apply uh, multiple uh, probes onto the uh, facial muscles. So what a nerve monitor basically does is when you go and touch the facial nerve, these muscles get stimulated and we'll be able to see those recordings. So this is uh, the way we can avoid damage to the seventh nerve in these cases. The nerve the monitor gives us good feedback. And this is used in parotid surgeries as well. And recently people have started using this in um, thyroid surgeries as well for recurrent laryngeal nerve function as well. Like you mentioned, it, there is a high chance of damage in all of these cases, and that's why stereotactic radio surgery is sometimes preferred over um, actual surgery for these patients. I hope that answers your question. Right, I'll just take your attendance, guys. Just give me a sec. All right, guys. Thank you. I've taken your attendance. Thank you. Have a great day.